We welcome you back to our late night uh, khatiras from Valley Islamic Center, studying together the book of Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya, Wadat al Sabirin, Wadakhirat al Shakirin, the excellence of patience and gratitude. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who are grateful to Him, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and those who exercise patience, Ya Allah. Uh, Shaykh, last time we talked from chapter 12, those who are following with us, chapter 12, we discussed together uh, the techniques that Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala was suggesting in regards to. Uh, uh, acquiring patience, how can you become patient? So we, we spoke about a few things, inshallah. I want to see, uh, please uh, summarize those those for us. Sure. Um, this is, subhanAllah, uh, in my opinion, the most profound part of the book in, in regards to the practical element of things. You'll notice in these 20 techniques, because obviously we're not going to be able to get into the full of each of them, you'll notice that they're categorized, there's a grouping, and there is sort of a prioritized way of dealing with impatience and then if this fails you go to this and if this fails you go to this and if this fails you go to this so if you look at the first three the first one was uh, that you uh, have so much honor for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you realize the position of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you realize that he's too high uh, for you to disobey him and he hears you and he sees you uh, Mashhad, whoever finds in their heart the witnessing of his ijlal, of his glory, of his honor, will find it very difficult uh, to commit that sin or to respond in a way that's not going to be befitting. So the first one is to realize that Allah is too high, He's too glorious, He's too great to be disobeyed in this way when the hardship comes. The second one, which was the, the, the really beautiful one, was the mashhad, was the witnessing of his mahabba, subhanahu wa ta'ala of loving him. So you leave that ma'asiyah mahabbatan lahu out of love for him subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is saying that is the most superior form of obedience, that is the most superior form of repentance, that is the most superior form of patience. When it's not fear driven or even incentive driven, it is out of a love that you have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you realize who he is and then you fall in love with him because of who he is and then the third one is mashhad al ni'ma wal ihsan. Fa inna al kareem la yuqabal bil isa'a min ihsanihi ilayhi. That you witness Allah's blessing upon you, His grace upon you, His bounty upon you. And when someone shows you bounty, you don't repay the one who has been good to you with evil. And so it starts off with who He is, you know how great Allah is, and of course, like there's just a pure. Uh, awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowing his power, knowing his greatness, knowing him by his asma' and sifat, knowing him by his names and attributes, like he's watching me right now. Then secondly, I love Allah too much to respond in a way that would be not pleasing to him. Then thirdly, the third one is, Allah has given me too much, his ni'am, his blessings. Now if you go back to the saying of Ibrahim ibn Adham rahimahullah ta'ala, what he told that man, disobey Allah if you want to in a place that doesn't belong to him, in a place he can't see you, and not using the blessings that he's given to you. Okay? Now what's the rapt? What's the tie-in between these three things? Uh, there's a beautiful hadith from the Prophet ﷺ where he said, Love Allah for the blessings that he provides to you. Love Allah for the blessings that he provides to you. Meaning what? The more you know him, the more you will love him. The more you know his blessings, the more that love will increase. So gratitude will increase you in that love of him and you'll start to become more aware like of the things that he's providing to you on a regular basis. And when you're connecting those faculties and connecting those blessings back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, surely you will not use them to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a moment of haste or in the moment of the pursuit of the lower self. فقال صلى الله عليه وسلم أحب الله لما يغذوكم من نعمه وأحبوني بحب الله وأحب أهل بيتي لحبي. He said, صلى الله عليه وسلم, love Allah for what He provides you of His blessings. Love me for the love of Allah. You, you know, if you knew the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم as just Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم before the age of forty, you would love him anyway. He's he's impossible not to love for being Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. But we love him most because he is Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, the most beloved of Allah's creation to him. 
and then love my family, love the family of the Prophet ﷺ by his love, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the summary of these three, uh, Shaykhna, and then we can go on to the fourth, is that وَالَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا إِبْتِغَاءَ وَجْهِ رَبِّهِمْ Allah mentions those who are patient out of seeking the pleasure of their Lord. This is the personal side of things, the love of Allah, and the number four we'll get into now. If the love of Allah has failed you, then you have to go to the fear of Allah. Number four, he says, قَالْ مَشْهَدُ الْغَضَبِ وَالْإِنْتِقَامِ I just want to remind the, uh, everybody here, inshallah, that what we're reading over here, these techniques of Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, is suggesting in order to uh, um, awaken that religious incentive by which you will be aware of what you're doing. And if you remember, we see that in order for our patients to be strong at the time of calamity or facing a trial or facing temptation, then you need to have a strong iman. And that strong iman needs, a, obviously, a practice of knowledge. And for that knowledge to be useful, it has to be extensive so you know exactly because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, min ulama. Those who truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are conscious of Allah azza wa jalla among his servants are those who have the knowledge. So that's what, we, what he's saying over here. In order for you to awaken that, in order for you to strengthen the, the religious sense of your actions, you need these things. So number four he says right now, مَشْهَدُ الْغَضَبِ وَالْإِنْتِقَامِ فَإِنَّ الرَّبَّ تَعَالَى إِذَا تَمَادَ الْعَبْدُ فِي مَعْصِيَتِهِ غَضِبْ وَإِذَا غَضِبَ لَمْ يَقُمْ لِغَضَبِهِ شَيْءٌ فَضْلًا عَنْ هَذَا الْعَبْدُ الْضَعِيفِ SubhanAllah So he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, that the realization of the ghadab, the anger, and the intiqam, the punishment of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So the ghadab instead of his hub, the anger of Allah instead of his love, the intiqam of Allah, the punishment of Allah in the place of his reward, and you realize that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets angry with a person as he persistently commits sins, nothing can withstand his wrath. Not, you know, of course, not weak human beings. And what this means, of course, rahimahullah ta'ala, as he's saying here, mm. what the scholars say, taqi ghadab al halim. Mm. Fear the anger of one who withholds his wrath from you. Allah withholds his punishment from you. And so if you consistently and persistently violate, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is certainly no. severe in His punishment. Shaykh subhanAllah, I noticed something uh, reflecting on number four in comparison to number three and number two. Uh, Imam ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he explained مَشْهَدُ الْغَضَبِ the, 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 the scene of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's anger with an individual with only two lines. He didn't elaborate much. Yeah. He says, and he, the way he says, he says, فَإِنَّ الرَّبَّ تَعَالَى The Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala Almighty إِذَا تَمَادَ الْعَبْدُ فِي مَعْصِيَدِهِ غَضَبِ if a person becomes persistent in disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will, will definitely will uh, cause Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be angry with them. قال, and then he said, وَإِذَا غَضِبْ لَمْ يَقُمْ لِغَضَبِهِ شَيْءٍ And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry with someone, nothing can stand against that anger of Allah. Nothing can stand against it. قال, فَضْلًا عَنْ هَذَا الْعَبْدُ الضَّعِيفِ Especially, especially this very weak creation. You as a human being, like you can't even stand against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wrath. Or Ghadab, may Allah subhanahu wa protect us from this, Rabbil Alameen. So as if Ibn Qayyim, he says that, look, I mean, just realizing that is enough deterrence. It's enough deterrence that if Allah is angry with you, you can't stand against him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're putting yourself in such extreme, extreme danger when you're causing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be angry with you. So as if he's saying, look, I don't have to talk too much about this. But if you make Allah angry, what's going to help you against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wrath and anger? Just like reflect on that, what he's saying. And then he goes to number five. قال number five الخامس مشهد الفوات وهو ما يفوده بالمعصية من خير الدنيا والآخرة وما يحدث له بها من كل اسم مذموم عقلا وشرعا وعرفا وزول عنه من الأسماء الممدوحة شرعا وعقلا وعرفا ويكفي هذا المشهد مشهد فوات الإيمان الذي أدنى مثقال ذرة منه خير من الدنيا وما فيها أضعافا مضاعفة فكيف أن يبيعه بشهوة تذهب لذاتها SubhanAllah. So now you realize the first four techniques all have to do with a personal relationship with Allah. If you haven't been able to stop yourself with knowing who Allah is and then loving Allah and then ascribing those blessings to Him and then the fear of Allah now let's get to your own incentives. And so the first thing he says is the loss or the, the awareness 
of al-fawat wa huwa ma yafutu bil ma'si min khayr ad-dunya wal akhirah the the awareness that you will lose out with that sin on both this dunya and this akhirah and as a result of those things that you you go forth with you're actually going to suffer in both of those realms so he says that because of that sin you're no longer given any praiseworthy names but instead you go from being a siddiq to a kathab you go from being a truthful one to being a liar you go from being uh, you know a muttaqi to a fajr you go from being a person who's praised for their piety to one who's blameworthy for their consistent transgression so you lose those praiseworthy names and you lose all of those praiseworthy titles according to the religion all of your reason all of the things that are good are taken away from you and he says subhanallah in this respect it is enough to realize that the quality of iman of faith the smallest part of which is better than the world and all of it one habba one atom's worth of faith is better than the entire possession of this world that that can also be compromised in the capacity of sin that if a person persists in sin and they let their desires overtake them then they may compromise their iman how could you sell your iman again an atom's worth which is better than the entire possession of this world for this temporary lust knowing that the joy of that lust will soon disappear while the consequences will remain forever Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he quotes a hadith to, uh, um, as an evidence and proof for that. Like, with doing that, you're going to lose a lot, specifically titles and labels that's supposed to be praiseworthy, and suddenly you become among those who are going to be no, the opposite. And he brings the hadith in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and A person who fornicates in that time, in that situation, is not doing it in a state of iman. What does that mean? You might believe that you're a mu'min. You believe this is haram, this is wrong. In the moment when this person is doing that act, while they're doing the act, they're not thinking of this to be haram. And therefore, that belief that this is haram is suspended from them for that moment. So the, the label that they once had as being mu'min is being removed from them in that moment. That's what he means by that. Which brings the explanation from the Sahaba, قال, iman Al-Iman will, will kind of like separate away from them. Imagine it, imagine it like some sort of like a, a, a cloud. So that cloud is, is, is attached to the individual. And when the person is engaged in a haram action, that Iman, it comes out as a cloud of hovering above them. And he says, قال, If this person stops or they, they, they repent, that cloud returns back to him or whatever is left of it. Whatever is left of that Iman will return back to them. May Allah protect us from Ya Rabbi Alameen. You know, Shaykh SubhanAllah, is my khutbah today. I was actually part of this hadith, taking off the garment of Iman. When a person sins, they are consciously trying to ignore Allah and they're constantly, they're, they are consciously trying to ignore consequence. Again, when you sin, you're consciously trying to ignore Allah and you're consciously trying to ignore consequence. Why are you doing that? So you can enjoy the moment of that sin. And you think about the messaging, the marketing of ma'asiyah, the marketing of sin is live your life, enjoy the moment, live it up. Don't think about tomorrow, right? It's live that moment. And I actually shared, subhanAllah, I know I may have said this even last year, but uh, you remember John Edward Sheikh who was running for president? way back in the day when decency was still like a major thing for presidential campaigns. Uh, so John Edwards was supposed to, you know, he was like at the head of the Democratic ticket. And like he was going to win the Democratic nomination and then it came out that he cheated on his wife and... He was promoting the family values and all the Right, exactly. right. So promoting sort of the good, the good boy image and the family image. And then came out that he cheated on his wife. And I remember, subhanAllah, not just the downfall, but I remember reading an article called The Psychology of a Cheater. I'll never forget it. The Psychology of a Cheater. And I was talking about how can a man whose wife had cancer, whose son died from a car accident, who's all about social values and caring for the poor and comes off as so empathetic, fall to such a lowly sin? And they were talking about how a cheater, when they're in the process of that cheating, they'll remove pictures of their families, they'll remove anything that reminds them of their actual life so that they can enjoy their affair. They're fantasizing, right? They're living in a separate world, in an alternative reality in those moments. 
When a person is sinning, when a person is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're trying to ignore Allah in the moment so that they can enjoy the sin. And there was a brother, subhanAllah, who, who came to Hajj with me, Shaykh, and he'd come to Hajj multiple times, uh, subhanAllah, and, and he kept coming to Hajj because he wanted to quit uh, pornography. Can you imagine? He's like, I'm going to keep coming to Hajj, and every year he'd come and he'd ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect him from it. And he kept on falling over and over again. And you know what made him quit? He told me, he said, subhanAllah, one time, you know, while he was watching, he forgot to turn off the Adhan app on his computer. And the Adhan went off in the middle of it. And he felt so disgusted with himself at that moment that he woke up. And he said that was the turn, right? Because he realized to consciously enjoy your sin, you have to consciously try to ignore Allah. And Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is saying, start with consciously remembering Allah and then consciously thinking about consequence so that you can stop yourself before you fall into that sin in the first place. SubhanAllah, to, to, to the similar, similar story, but from a different perspective, Shaykh, now, when I, used to, when I was living in Europe at the time, um, I remember somebody came to me with a situation about somebody that they knew, and they were asking, uh, what's the condition of their Islam or Iman right now? So the story is, this guy, his name is Muhammad, and unfortunately, he was not really in holding himself, you know, to that name, really, up to that name. So he was in that kind of lifestyle where he commits sins and so forth. So in one of those moments, he had a lady with him, and he was about to commit zina with her. And that lady, out of nowhere, he said, right when they're almost about to start with the act, yeah, and subhanAllah, she's asking him, she goes, um, your name is, uh, because we go by Muhammad or Mo or something like that. She goes, you're Muhammad, right? And uh, he said, yeah. She goes, aren't you Muslim? And he goes, um, why are you asking the question? She says, because I thought that Muslims don't do these things. SubhanAllah, she was telling him, I thought Muslims do not do these things. You know what he said to her? He said, no, I'm not a Muslim. Allah musta'an. Now, I know if I'm going to give him the, the benefit of the doubt. Why did he tell her he was not Muslim? Because he th I think he was protecting Islam. If I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. Like, he wants her to stay, believe that Muslims are good and they don't do these things. He sacrificed himself for it. He said, no, I'm not. And the Prophet said some warnings against this. If someone attributes disbelief or kufr to themselves, it will fall on them. So in this situation, like I said, he removes himself completely to justify that and make it easy for them. So the brother was asking, what's the condition of his Islam and Iman at that moment? And Allah understand, obviously, if the person was saying it out of really belief, definitely leave, that, leave Islam for that. But if he was doing it, again, in his own mind, he's trying to protect Islam and from, you know, from his own sins and mistakes, so he removes himself completely from Islam, not to uh, disturb this lady with that image, uh, and then may Allah forgive him for that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful of Allah. No. Want to read six? No. And number six, he says, قَال مَشْهَدُ الْقَهْرِ وَالظَّفَرِ قال هي أعظم من الظفر بعدوهم الآدميين وأحلى موقعا وأتم فرحة وأما عاقبته فأحمد عاقبة وهي كعاقبة شرب الدواء النافع الذي أزال داء الجسد وعاده إلى صحته واعتداله نعم سبحان الله so this is where this gets I mean this is very practical advice he says the awareness of subdual and triumph the subjugation and triumph over the shaitan produces happiness, rejoicing, and joy to those who experience it, which is greater, sweeter, and even more enjoyable than the subjugation of their human enemies. So winning against the shaitan gives you a certain type of sweetness that even winning against your worst human enemy will not give you. And you know what this is, subhanAllah? Celebrate your wins. Celebrate your wins. When you restrain yourself for that first time, you know, when, you, when you're able to overcome the shaitan for that first time, say alhamdulillah, smile, own it. Say a'udhu billahi minash shaitan al-rajim. You've reduced him to something lower. He wasn't able to get you in that moment. And this is the, uh, the situation of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu, right? Like shaitan got so tired of Umar radiallahu anhu beating him <laughs> that he just stopped even walking on the same street as him. Umar radiallahu anhu was like trying to, to defeat him and he was finding such joy. And so the first time that you hold yourself back, 
Don't tell yourself, I'm a loser, I'm going to fall to it again. Say, Alhamdulillah, look, I was able to overcome it. Those of you that quit something in Ramadan, celebrate that. Don't go celebrate it with everybody else. Like, you know, again, this is the overexposure and like, you know, act like you're the most religious Muslim in the world because you just quit something. But to yourself and to Allah, when you're making dua, Ya Allah, Alhamdulillah, I left this for your sake. I feel good. Ya Allah, give me the ability to keep leaving this for your sake. Make the shaitan so little in his power, in his effect. Reduce his waswas. You had him chains and you had him so low in this Ramadan. Ya Allah, I'm, I'm conquering him in this regard. So celebrate the victory that you have over the shaitan when Allah grants you an opening of a victory over him. And that is sweeter. That's a sweeter feeling than, than victory over your human enemies. If you would like to uh, uh, even imagine that in a, a practical way that is easy to understand and reflect on, imagine uh, a child or imagine yourself when you were first kid, when you were a kid and it was your first time uh, fasting. Imagine when your parents were trying to tell you, hey, you can still break your fast at noon, right? Uh, in our culture, they used to call it Siyam uh, al-Asafir, like the, 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 the sparrows fasting. You know, just you fast until noon and khalas, and you can break your fast. But then as you start growing older, you see the adults are not breaking their fast like birds. They want to even make it longer. So you say, no, I'm not going to, I'm not breaking my fast. I'm not going to break my fast until the time for Salat al-Maghrib. SubhanAllah, I remember when, uh, when our pastor was still up there, when, when it's time for Salat al-Maghrib, the kids are gathering around the table where, where the adults are breaking their fast, and they're waiting, and everybody's holding a date in his hand, and just waiting for the moment. The moment they hear the adhan, they put it in their mouth, and the joy on their face is what we're talking about over here. That moment of happiness and joy in the face of these children, you can imagine how much they're happy that they were able to conquer their desire to eat and break their fast, their, their, their ability to continue and hold themselves, subhanAllah, even though the temptations were there, and guess what, even against their own parents. The parents were telling them, hey, break your fast, but these kids said no. Their parents are telling them, look, you're justified, you can't break your fast, but these kids are stopping, I kind of resisting all these temptations. And then in that moment when they break their fast, subhanAllah, that joy and that moment is what Imam Ibn Qayyim is talking about over here on a regular basis for the adults. When you wake up for Fajr and you have all these shayateen over your head, come on, you know, you're too tired, you have to go to work, you have to go to school. Um, you know, Allah ghafur rahim, khalas, Ramadan is over, you can pray here in the, in, in the, in the room, inshallah ta'ala. And then you just say, no, a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. You get up, you make wudu, you go to the masjid and you pray with the jama'ah and after that you feel so refreshed. That's what he's talking about over here. Versus, versus when people, they, they, get, they um, you know, they, they, they give in to the shaitan's temptation no matter what. That's when they realize that their level of patience is still at the infancy level. Remember, Imam Qayyim, he says, look, when it comes to patience, it grows with you. So infants, they need just to be patient from, you know, not having food. When you become a, 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 um, a kid, then patience against games and plays and, and jo the joy of, of playing around. Then when you become a, a teenager against the desires and become an adult, you know, temptations of the mind and so on. So if people will always fall and give in to the shaitan's temptation, they're still at the infancy when it comes to their patience. They can't even resist, you know, yeah, 10, 10 hours fasting. So that's what he's referring to over here. So make sure that you increase your wins against the shaitan, your, your start and your checkpoints, alhamdulillah, it makes you feel joyful versus every time you beat yourself down because why did I have to do that? I could have, you know, waited for this. It wasn't really worth it. It was so you always blame yourself for falling into the temptations. Shaykh, I've got a story actually from one of the Salaf, Wahb ibn Munabbah rahimahullah ta'ala. One time he had a captive uh, after a battle, and the captive, I mean, he was showing him goodness and khayr as you're supposed to, and the man broke the leg of his sheep. So he told him, why did you do that? He said, to make you angry. He said, now I'm going to make angry the one who told you to make me angry, go free. I'm going to make angry the one who told you to make me angry. Just get out of here. Go, you're free. <laughs> That's conquering the shaitan in real time. And when you untie those knots every morning, by getting, getting up and doing wudu and making fajr and reading your athkar as-sabah and just 
Uh, when you give charity, when he tells you not to, when you take a stand, when he tells you cower, when you when you do these things, the Prophet said, If your good deeds make you happy and your bad deeds make you sad, you're a mu'min. That's a sign of belief that after you do a good deed, you're not proud, you're happy, you're content, you're satisfied. Alhamdulillah, I won today against the shaytan. Let me keep winning against him. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah concludes this actually this point saying that وَهُوَ كَعَقِبَةِ شُرْبِ الدَّوَاءِ النَّافِعِ الَّذِي أَزَالَ دَاءَ الْجَسَدِ Because doing that, it's just like when you, when you uh, uh, drink the medicine or take the medication. It might, be, it might be bitter, it might be sour, it might taste horrible, and it actually it's, it's, you don't like it at all, but guess what? You still do it, and then it will heal your body. And he says the same thing. When you resist all these temptations, Yes, it's bitter, it's difficult, it's hard, but then it will heal your soul. So the, 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 the ramification and the result of it is, is in your favor, which means make sure that you always try to conquer one against the shaitan. Number seven. He says, number seven, مَشْهَدُ الْعِوَضِ وَهُوَ مَا وَعَدَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ مِنْ تَعْوِيدِ مَنْ تَرَكَ الْمَحَارِمَ لِأَجْلِهِ وَنَهَا نَفْسَهُ عَنْ هَوَاهَا وَلِوَازِنَهُ بَيْنَ الْعِوَضِ وَالْمُعَوِّضِ أو المعوض فأيهما كان أولى بالإثار اختاره وارتضاه لنفسه. So he says, at that point now, what do you think about the consciousness of the reward? What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you as compensation. And he says, this is the compensation which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised for the people who abandon prohibitions for his sake and they restrain their souls from their desires. One should compare the compensation with the one who compensates, choose that which is better and take it for him. Uh, I think that you know one of the things that you think about here is the visualization of reward. You know, some people will say, "Why is you know I don't? Uh, I'm doing it. Uh, let's be. Let's, this is my disclaimer. There, I'm doing a whole series on Jannah for Ramadan. All right. So these comments are particularly a little bit like bother someone. Someone says, "Why do we even need Jannah? You know, I don't, why do I even need to hear about Jannah?" Allah created you and Allah knows you. Allah created me and Allah knows me. Therefore, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to talk about the details of this reward to diminish your appetite of the things that are displeasing to Him and could compromise His reward, His pleasure, it's because He knows you. And it's okay to believe in these incentives and to let those incentives drive you and this is not a means of undermining your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you want his Jannah, you're asking for his Jannah. And this is where the scholars say, and this is actually a, a way to break it up into two, it, Imam bin Rajab rahimahullah ta'ala, I forget which, which, uh, which book he does this in, but he compared the two and he put them side by side. He said, you love Allah and that you will not choose anyone over Allah in this dunya. You love Allah's reward in that you will not choose to reward your nafs in this dunya if that means you're going to sacrifice his reward. And so those two things are actually in harmony with one another. That I love Allah and I love what Allah has promised me and it is not worth losing my relationship with Allah nor losing the reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised me. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala in this point he did not even mention what the, what the compensation is. He said look Mashhadul Iwa, this is the, 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 uh, the, the position of, of the compensation, what Allah's compensated you with. Qal, wa huwa, and it is, what it is exactly, what is the reward that you're going to get? He says, ma wa'ad Allah, whatever Allah promised. He's just telling you whatever Allah promised. And as a believer, you should know what Allah promised you with. You should know the details of that. If you read the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, وسلم, they would know exactly. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising you with, the details of Al Jannah and its reward and all these beautiful things and so on. There is no doubt in that. So Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he just want, he left it for you to imagine. He says, Look, think about the compensation. All what Allah promised you with. And then compare these two things. The one that Allah is promising you with, and the one that the shaitan is promising you with. Like, hey, do this, and that's what you get as a result of that. The shaitan is tempting you, telling you, if you do this, you're going to feel this way, you're going to feel this way. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you stay away from this, I'll get you this, and I'll get you this. And compare, he says, compare these two things, and choose for yourself which one you're willing to give up for the other one. And choose wisely. And subhanAllah, there's a saying, also Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said that a sin is a 
temporary moment of pleasure followed mm. by a lifetime of regrets. Whereas a good deed is a temporary moment of struggle followed by a lifetime of pleasure. Mm. So choose the temporary moment of struggle with the lifetime of pleasure over the temporary moment of pleasure with the lifetime of struggle that follows yeah. it. Point number eight that he says that will help you, inshallah, increase your uh, uh, religious يعني, kind of a, uh, a position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that knowledge. قال مشهد المعية وهو نوعان معية عامة ومعية خاصة فالعامة اطلاع الرب عليه وكونه بعينه لا تخفى عليه حاله وقد تقدم هذا والمقصود هنا المعية الخاصة كقوله تعالى إن الله مع الصابرين وقوله إن الله مع الذين اتقوا والذين هم محسنون وقوله وإن الله لمع المحسنين فهذه المعية الخاصة خير وأنفع في دنياه وآخرته ممن قضى وطره ونال شهوته على التمام من أول عمره إلى آخره فكيف يؤثر عليها لذة منغصة منكدة في مدة يسيرة من العمر إنما هي كأحلام نائم أو كظل زائل الله. Uh, this is a powerful one, subhanAllah, to reflect on how bad you want to be Allah's friend, that you want Allah's companionship. al when he says Ama and Khasa, there's the companionship of Allah in the general sense that Allah sees and hears all of us. But then there's the specific Allah being with you, that Allah be your companion. Now, what's the difference between this and the first three? Uh, this is actually the reward itself of Allah's companionship versus the incentive of your personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not wanting to compromise his love and these types of things, but actually wanting the feeling of his closeness, wanting the feeling of his companionship, wanting to be in that extra category. And the believer does not just seek to be just a Muslim. Seek to be a wali of Allah. Who told you you can't be a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What tawallani fi man tawallayt? Who told you you can't come under his special guardianship? Who told you you can't reach that level and be amongst those people that have that special ma'iyya, that special closeness to him? And he mentions the ayat that talk about al ma'iyyatul khasa kiqawlihi inna allaha ma'asabirin. That's that specific companionship, that special companionship. Allah is with the patient and his saying, inna allaha ma'aladina taqa wa ladina hum muhsinun. Allah is with those who are conscious of him and those who do good deeds. And then finally, wa inna allaha lama al muhsinin. And verily, Allah is with the good doers. Notice the comparison between these three things, by the way. The first one is a person who is patient, which includes hardship and desire. The second one, ma'aladina taqo, those who specifically restrain themselves from sin, okay, and they do good deeds. The third one, Allah is with those who excel in their good deeds. They do actions of excellence. They're not just getting by, they're actually trying to do more. And he says, listen, this type of ma'iyya, Allah being with you, Allah as your companion, that is better to you in this dunya and in the hereafter than the pleasure of a man who satisfi satisfies his desires in full from the beginning to its end. How can a person not prepare, prefer that joy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being your friend, being your companion to a disturbing and corrupting short-lived joy which is just another moving shadow. It's just, a, it's just a fantasy. It's just another shadow that you chase that moves on from you and you actually achieve nothing. So SubhanAllah, even the visualization here, a shadow that you're, you're trying to chase versus the ma'iyya of Allah, Allah being with you that you can have and that you can actually perceive that closeness and that companionship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why do you aim so low? Why do you aim so low just to be getting by with your religion? Why not aim and say, Ya Allah, make me a friend. Oh Allah, let me be your friend. Oh Allah, let me be from your awliya. Oh Allah, let me have your companionship. And I think a very you know, practical form of this too, Shaykh, is that if you practice these, these first uh, six, seven things, you're probably going to find your friend circle shrinking. Sure. You're going to find your friend circle shrinking because the more serious you get about life, the more incentivized you are by the hereafter, the more connected you get to Allah, you're just going to find that less people are going to want to be with you in that. 
because their pursuits are going to be different, their interests are going to be different, their priorities are going to be different, the way they talk is going to be different, the things they pursue that's going to be different. You're either going to fall back into your lower standards to get with them, or you're going to find yourself in ghurba, estranged from them, because you're aiming higher, not because you're rude, not because you're a jerk, not because you talk down to people in a condescending way, but you're finding that what you're attracted to now and what you want is different from what people want, and so your friend circle gets smaller, and that's where that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes so much more compelling. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those that ha have that ma'iyyah to that Amin have Amin that Amin specific Amin. companionship. I mean, why do we need ma'iyyah anyway? Why do you need this kind of companionship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's interesting, and uh, just before we came here, my son was asking me again about the meaning of the word rafiq in the Arabic language, which means uh, companion. And when you use it by saying rafiq ud darb, which means the, the road companion or the travel buddy. Why is it so, um, so intimate when you hear those words put in together? Because as humans, when we, when we are on a journey, we don't want to be alone. We love to have a companion with us, really. Someone that we you can enjoy those moments together. Uh, maybe not necessarily, you know, uh, to take selfies or pictures, but at least someone with whom you feel that, you know what, I want to be with them on that journey. Imagine on that journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one, the companion that is with you is Allah Azza wa Jalla. Imagine if that's your situation. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he refers to two paths. He said that, um, uh, do not be deceived. He said, do not be deceived by the path of the shaitan. Uh, Even though the, the, those who go through this, there are so many. They're ruined, but there are so many. And don't be sad by the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ala qillat al-salikin. No matter how little the number of people walking on that path. To your Lord, Sheikh, as you start becoming more religious and more, you know, to it, you will start having less and less uh, uh, people interested in that path of yours. Because people, they would like to be, you know, in the, in the easy life of the dunya, subhanAllah. And that reminds me, in the sense we all would love to have companions, we always look for the best companionship, probably. People would like to be with this person, that person. Unfortunately, nowadays, it's all about celebrity status and names and fames, unfortunately, not for the right reason. But at the time of the Prophet Wasallam, one time the Messenger of Allah Wasallam, he uh, was on a journey, and there was a young man with him that he was traveling with him, serving the Prophet Wasallam, serving him with the wudu and carrying the water for him and helping him with his uh, luggage and so on. So when the Prophet Wasallam arrived, he always, would, he always rewards the people who, who help out. So the Prophet told this young man, he goes, Qal, um, sell me, ask me, how can I reward you for your service? This young man, unbelievable, the way, the way subhanAllah, he thought about it in that moment. He, he realized this statement from the Prophet is just like a wish granted. Imagine if you've been given a wish that is granted, what would you ask for? So this young man, he asked the Prophet Qal, Uridu suhbataka fil jannah. I want to be your companion in Jannah. Can you imagine, you know, how lofty that goal is? Like the Prophet said to him, that's just to serve him on the road. He said, he asked him, how can I reward you for this? He goes, I want to be your friend in Jannah. And the Prophet Sallallahu he just kind of like was shocked by the request. He even he was uh, taken aback and he goes, Qal awa hada. Anything else I can grant you for you? Like, I can't guarantee this for you. And the man, he goes, that's it. You give me this or Jazakallah khair and nothing. Yani. So he put the Prophet in this situation, like, I want to reward you, but I want to reward you with something I can guarantee for you. But that's something that's not in my hand to even guarantee to you. But the man insisted, he goes, if you want me to do this, they're going to give me something, I, I want to be your friend in Jannah, your companionship in Jannah. Because, he, look, if you become the companion of the Prophet in Jannah, where are you going to be, a Jama'ah? The VIP, everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, the VIP places, right? You go to conferences and you go with Sheikh Omar, you know, as a companion, you end up where? In the backstage rooms and all these things. And other people, you know, just like, whoa, where you been there, right? SubhanAllah. And that's where just humans. We're just humans. Imagine you are now with the Prophet ﷺ in Jannah. So the Prophet ﷺ gave him, alhamdulillah, an answer to all of us that we can benefit from. All of us, we can equally benefit from. The Prophet ﷺ said, okay then, a'inni ala nafsika bi kathrat sujood Help me out. Help me out to get you there by increasing your sujood, which means pray a lot. Pray a lot. You might say, wait a minute. I mean, I thought we have only five daily prayers, right? 
Yeah, my kids, my little kids, any kid can pray the five daily prayers. The competition is in the volunteerly ones, is the optional ones. Is praying tahajjud, praying at duha, praying, you know, uh, um, uh, at different times of the day and the night. Because when you do that, you are in a companionship with the Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are always with him in salah. And definitely, you deserve to be among those who will be in the elite and VIP left in Jannah. May Allah make us all among them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. No. Shaykh, subhanAllah, I was just reflecting. If you look at the last person to enter into Jannah uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi talked about, uh, as he's making asks of Allah, he never mentions being with the Prophet Sallallahu He never mentions being with Allah. He's like, I want this palace, I want this tree, I want this. This is the lowest mu'min in Jannah, the lowest believer. But when the Sahaba talked about Jannah, they just wanted to be with the Prophet Sallallahu like their aspiration was Jannah is being with the Prophet Sallallahu So even like the, the, the difference in the ask and uh, SubhanAllah, the, tomorrow's the 25th day, the 26th uh, lesson of the Jannah series is actually about Al-Firdaus. It's actually about Adin and Al-Firdaus and Wasila and being with the Prophet Sallallahu And then 27th is being with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Like that desire to be with Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you'll get the best palaces anyway. You'll get the best... Uh, the best waterfalls anyway, you'll get everything, the best of Jannah anyway if you get that. But that's where you really want to be aiming and that is such a greater incentive than the material rewards even about Jannah. You know, Sheikh, that was also still good compared to what people wish for today these days. Now when you ask people, they just want to be just cross the bridge over Jahannam. That's enough for me. Yani. Our, our, unfortunately, our incentive is becoming so low, like we kind of look... We don't value ourselves properly, unfortunately. We do not really value ourselves properly. So as a result, what do we do? We just want to uh, enter Jannah. That's all. Okay, what's your incentive? What, what do you want to be in Jannah? Look, if I cross over the bridge of Je over Jahannam, I'm happy. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Why, why our aspirations, unfortunately, drop down to that level, unfortunately? We need to be at a higher level, inshallah, with the barakah wa ta'ala. Bidnillah, Azza wa Jal. Number nine, inshallah, we, we, con we conclude with that, inshallah, Azza wa Jal. Number nine, he says, قال, مشهد المغافصة والمعالجة. That these are, even the Arabic word are actually weird in, in terms of the meaning of them. قال, وهو أن يخاف أن يغافصه الأجل فيأخذه على, على غرة. فيحال بينه وبين ما يشتهي من لذات الآخرة فيا لها من حسرة ما أمرها وما أصعبها لكن لا يعرفها إلا من جربها وفي بعض الكتب القديمة يا من لا يأمن على نفسه طرفة عين ولا يتم له سرور يوم الحذر الحذر So number nine is the contemplation or the worry of a sudden encounter that something can suddenly strike you and what is that sudden encounter? Death, al maut And that death can come to you at any time and it could catch you when you're unaware. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deprives you of what you wish for, of the joys of the hereafter. And the disappointment is so bitter and hard that only a person who has experienced it can understand it. And he mentions that some of the early scriptures, he could be quoting like a biblical verse or something else. Uh, oh, you who is not safe about himself at any time, and who was, I mean, you can't even guarantee that you can blink your eye another time. You, you cannot guarantee even the next moment of your life uh, and unable to even guarantee for yourself that you'll be able to com you know, complete the happiness or attain the happiness of that day. Be careful. And SubhanAllah, this is one of the greatest ways to actually protect yourself. You know, death has the ability to reduce the appetite that can lead to the growth of lust and can lead to an in inappropriate uh, response to the patience of hardship, but the suddenness of death can also make you think about like, do I really want to die here? Do I really want to die doing this? Do I really want to die saying this? Do I really want to die around these people? Right? Like, is this really how I want to go out? And if you can't say yes in that moment, then why are you there? Why are you doing it? Why are you with those people if you can't say yes at that moment? Why are you saying it and doing it at that moment if you can't say yes at that moment? And so the, the, the thought of the sudden nature of how death can strike you uh, is that... Sheikh, I'd recommend actually we just quickly read 10 because it actually connects to it. If you want to just quickly read it. Sure, sure. Um, number 10, he says, قال, مشهد البلاء والعافية فإن البلاء في الحقيقة ليس إلا الذنوب وعواقبها 
والعافية المطلقة هي الطاعات وعواقبها فأهل البلاء هم أهل المعصية وإن عوفيت أبدانهم وأهل العافية هم أهل الطاعة وإن مرضت أبدانهم الله أكبر So he's saying a true understanding of affliction, of trial and safety And he said a person has to remember that the greatest trial, the greatest hardship is actually sin and its consequences while the greatest form of safety is obedience and the outcome of obedience, meaning the reward of that obedience. The people who are tested the most, when you think of test, when I tell you someone's being tested, you think about you know, someone who is going through a difficult trial with their health, you think about someone who's going through a difficult trial with their wealth, but the greatest test is when you're being tested with sinfulness, when you're in a state of disobedience. And he's saying, so the people who are the greatest, in the greatest trial, are those who are involving themselves in sins, even if they're safe physically. And the people who are spared, the people of Afia, in the true sense, are those who are doing good deeds, even if they're suffering from ill health at the moment. This is a powerful realization, a powerful realization, because when the ulama saw someone who was physically hurting, they said, Nasallahu Afia, may Allah grant us safety, may Allah spare us. And when they saw someone who was sinning, Nasallahu Afia, I'm not going to condemn or condescend or mock because. I seek Allah's protection from falling into that. The greatest form of trial is to be in a state of disobedience. When you're spiritually sick, even if you're physically healthy, you are greatly sick. And when you're spiritually healthy, even if you're physically sick, then you are amongst those who are spared in the true sense of the word. And knowing that will grant you great patience with the moment because it'll put in perspective the temporary desire or the temporary difficulty in that regard. I, I see our a guest is actually, is, mashallah, just uh, showed up here amongst us, Sheikh Saad Taslim. And if it's okay, I want to call him in to take my seat, inshallah ta'ala, maybe to reflect with you, bin Allah, on that. You can take my seat. Oh, come on, you took my parking spot, it's That's okay, right. I can give you my seat. <laughs> Sheikh Saad, hold on. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa I just, I didn't agree to this. I just stopped by to give salams, so I don't know what's going on. Jazakallah <laughs> We do our late night khatir as we discuss the book of Ibn Qayyim al Jazeera, rahimahullah, the Audit al Sabirin, with the Khirat al Shakirin, and the excellence of patience and gratitude. And as we running, right now we're discussing uh, 20 points or 20 techniques from Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah in regards to uh, um, uh, increasing your religious awareness that will help you increase your level of patience against temptations and sins and so forth. I know you taught, you taught a class for Al-Maghrib Institute in regards to the shaitan, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, from, from that point of uh, that perspective, I want, I want to hear from you, inshallah, a few words, Bin Allah, that you can give, inshallah, our audience here and our brothers and sisters watching with us. From that perspective, against the shaitan, what are the things that you believe, alhamdulillah, from, uh, uh, from that kind of class that you can share with us? Techniques that people look, I want to increase my patience against falling into the sin, and here are a few things I want to learn about, inshallah. Bismillah, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi man wala. So, one of the things that we really focus on in that seminar is how the shaitan tailors his methods of deception for every individual. So, we kind of sometimes when we hear about the deception of the shaitan or the tricks of the shaitan, you know. If you were to Google like the tricks of the shaitan, there's like tons of lectures. Like here's 10 tricks of the shaitan. And in this seminar, what we wanted to do was take a look at those tricks, but also to make it personal. And so for that seminar, I, I would say like this is not, like it's a study of the shaitan, but it's actually a study of ourselves. Because unless, in, unless we understand our own uh, ourselves, so our own fears and our own desires, our own temptations, what we want, then we won't be, if we don't know that, we're not going to know how the shaitan is going to attack us personally. So a big part of that is reflecting on our lives and seeing how the shaitan may come at me. So if we're talking about desires, what you may desire may be different than what I desire based off of what you have going on in life and based off of what I have going on in life. And I'll just be real, uh, being somebody who does public speaking or is in put in p certain positions, I know the shaitan's coming at me in, in certain ways that are specific to me. 
And that's why, uh, you know, we talk about, there's this one section of the seminar where we talk about al-kaba'ir, uh, major sins. And Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, has this very interesting um, uh, 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 section where he talks about when it comes to the kaba'ir, and I don't know if I can say this here, but I'm going to say it anyway. Good, good. Uh, he targets, the shaitan targets scholars and people of knowledge. And that's very shocking for people to hear that, especially in the seminar. And, you know, why? Well, because the shaitan, there's a couple reasons. Number one, uh, the way the shaitan works is he tries to get the most benefit out of the least amount of work. And so we reflect upon how, like, if the shaitan gets a person of knowledge, a person in a position of leadership to commit a major sin, how much damage is the shaitan able to do? Well, number one, there's a lot of people that look up to this certain individual. And so if this, this, this well-known public figure, scholar, commits a major sin, the average person looks at that and says, well, if they fell into that sin, what hope do I have? Mm. Right? Like, what, what, like, I have this person, so-and-so, so well-known, such a big scholar, I look up to this person, what hope do I have? The other issue is, may Allah protect this, is that when a, position, when a person is in that position, um, their ego can get inflated. Right? They may think very highly of themselves and their reputation may mean everything to them. And so now that opens up another door of a person wanting to uh, kind of be tempted to, to try and justify and rationalize the sin that they've committed. And there's a level of power that a person has there a, as a scholar, as a person of knowledge, that the average person is not going to be like, hey man, like, do you really know what you're talking about? There's, a, there's a, already a, built, uh, a trust that is built for this individual. And if a, if a scholar, and Allah says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرٍ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know, right? That's the average person, that's our responsibility, ask the people of knowledge. So now the scholar may wield that power and say, you know what, you know, I know this is considered bad or whatever, but actually, there's a difference of opinion, and some scholars have said that it's actually not, the, and they may try and rationalize and justify that. And now, subhanAllah, if a scholar justifies a sin, how many people are going to follow that scholar in that disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No. So for the shaitan now, this is like a big, it's like, you know, say like, he tries to get the most bang for his buck. Like that's a lot of benefit that he's gotten. So, uh, a lot, so that's just me in, in my space. But all of us, we are all facing different challenges in life, uh, different tests and trials. There's things that we desire personally, like maybe job or relationships or whatever it may be. A lot of defeating the shaitan has to do with getting to know ourselves and being introspective about, you know, what are my fears, desires, weaknesses, temptations. Jazakallah khair, barakallah, this is different, subhanAllah, very important thing, specific in terms of fitan, like ours, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all, ya Rabbil Alameen. Um, I'm gonna, inshallah ta'ala, uh, take extra 10 minutes of your time to go over some of the questions that we received. So if we can put the QR code up there, inshallah ta'ala, for any brothers and sisters who would like to uh, 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 kind of send us a question. Um, also, if anybody from the sister side, again, make sure that your padlet is colored, so I know it's coming from the sister side. And if anyone is from the, our online audience, just let us know where you're sending your question from, inshallah ta'ala. Sheikh, a quick question over here from a sister. She said, Qalat, um, what if we, uh, we uh, have this sin we can't stop, and we keep stumbling into again and again? We keep doing tawbah, but stumble again. How long do we keep going? Or what should we focus on more uh, from, uh, uh, from this? Do we focus on a car, fasting, talking to Allah, making dua? How can we stop that? So I'm, I'm just going to be, uh, once again, I said I, I'm going to keep it real. Uh, Sheikh, I, I don't know if you've ever been on a Q&A session with me, but most people find it to be very annoying. No, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Sheikh Omar said, that's why I left. Um, I, I don't like doing open Q&As, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll tell you why. When a person asks a question, I really don't know this individual. I don't know their personal struggles and challenges and like what they're really going through. Mm. So for me to give an answer is, and say, you know what, it, you should do this X, Y, and Z, do this specific thing. It may work for you. It may actually even work against you because I don't know how you personally are, are, are dealing with, with this issue. Um, there's, there's so many ways I could answer that question depending on the individual, their level of knowledge, their connection with Allah, the people around them. So many things could, could, uh, could affect that. 
No. Uh, if I had to say one thing, uh, what stuck out to me in this question was how long do I keep doing it? You, you do it, you keep making tawbah as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a single breath to breathe. There's a hadith mentioned in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed, once again, going back to the shaitan, in which there's a conversation that takes place between the shaitan and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where the shaitan says to Allah, he says, uh, ya Rabb. He says, I swear by your honor, my Lord, I will continue to mislead the children of Adam uh, as long as their souls are in their bodies, I will continue to mislead them. And then Allah replies and says, وَجَلَالِي And I swear by my honor and my majesty that you can do that. And I will continue to forgive them as long as they keep seeking my forgiveness. Mm -hmm. right. And that is really the Achilles heel of the shaitan. Right. The shaitan cannot win as long as we keep returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, uh, I think this question is also maybe tied into the same principle of open question and kind of, but I, uh, it's a very important because I think a lot of people might uh, resonate with such a, a dilemma a person is going through. So a brother is asking, saying, when Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said, when a person commits a sin and tries to ignore Allah for his pleasure, and then after that he may lose Iman and will have whatever was left for it. Zakh like hadith Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you know, Iman comes as a cloud and whatever is left of it comes back to the individual. He says, can that person ever be on Allah's good side? Like, I feel this had happened to me. Please help me out. Do I have hope? Yeah, so, uh, Bismillah. So the issue of, uh, of hope, and, and you know, I, I'm just, I can't get out of it. I'm in the shaitan mindset you, you right know, now. You know, is, there, yeah. is there such a thing as I'm cursed forever? Yeah. Um, Islam 101, y'all, no, right? No. Once again, as long as Allah has given us the ability to make tawbah and return to Allah, we never make, we don't, we never make a hukum on someone else and say, you're cursed, nor do we make that hukum upon ourselves. The shaitan wants very much for us to lose hope in other people and to lose hope in ourselves. And that is truly the only time the shaitan has really won is when he has convinced us that there's no turning back to Allah, that there's, that there's no hope. That's when he is only, that's the only true victory he gets. Anything else, he can mislead us for days, weeks, years, decades. A person may live their whole life in the disobedience of Allah, being tempted by the shaitan, and the shaitans come from every different angle. But the moment the servant of Allah says, Rabbi ghfirli, my Lord, forgive me, all of that deception gets laid to waste. And the shaitan is very afraid of that. So, so absolutely. No. Here's a question come from a brother who says, what if your close friends are not as religious as you do? Um, or actually, not, not, not as religious, he says. So uh, what do you do in this case? Do you distance yourself from them? Or do you stay around and be the good influence? What do you suggest for this individual? So what you do is uh, you, you book a session with Sheikh Yasser Burjaz at <laughs> office <laughs> hours. <laughs> And you go sit with him, and you, you explain your situation to him, um, and then he'll, he'll, no. he'll help you. If I, might, if I might say something, and subhanAllah, the Prophet says in the hadith, um, uh, A person who intermingles with the people, endures their adha, their harm, and their course of fitna, better than the person who isolates themselves. Do not intermingle with the people to avoid, you know, being harmed by their evil and so on. So there is reward in being among the people and enduring these fit and these trials. However, your safety comes first. We talk about your spiritual and physical safety, obviously. So if someone being around these people thinking that, you know what, um, I'm strong enough, inshallah, to guide them to Allah Azza wa And then they tempt them and they, they lose their iman. In this case, stay away from them. But alhamdulillah, you build that emotional shield where you can protect yourself from whatever influence they have over you. And uh, uh, their companionship is not going to affect your iman and your deen, inshallah ta'ala. Then you better stay with them and try to guide them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What about us. when the shaitan comes to you and says, don't worry, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Right? Hang out with them. You can give them da'wah, you know, and, and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And the shaitan says, it'll be, it'll be okay. When what, what do I say? Huh? What do I say to him? Yeah. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so how do you know, Sheikh? Like, how do you know if, if you know, in this situation, mm -hmm. should you have patience over their heart? It's at, at your discretion, which means a case-by-case -case scenario. Like, for example, these friends, they want to go to a party. And you say, this is my friend, I don't want to leave them there. They might, Audu Billah, you know, do something bad. So I'm going to go to make sure they don't do anything bad. Bad idea. Okay? Don't do that. Because going there is going to be extremely dangerous. But you have a friend who's sitting around, and they just, they, they're kind of like sitting for hours probably. I would go there for half an hour and just check, check out and see what the situation is. If I can give them something good, uh, good guidance, maybe pull one of them out of the situation, alhamdulillah. But if it's going to drag forever and they're going to waste my time and my deen, then I'd rather actually stay away from that. So it's a case-by-case it's a case scenario. So I'm the sure answer that. is, if no. Sheikh Yasser Burjaz would go, then you can go. No, no, no. So no. ask yourself, <laughs> would Sheikh Yasser Burjaz go to this gathering or not? No. But I, by the way, I received a lot of questions uh, about family issues. It requires counseling. Like say, how, come, how much can I be patient with my in-laws? How much can I be patient with my husband? My wife is doing this. Yes, your man, these are not, you can't answer this like this in an open forum like this, Sani. These are counseling situations. But if I want to make comment on this particular issue, with those who keep complaining about their situation with their parents, with their siblings, with their children, with their in-laws, and all that stuff, look, if you look in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions so many family stories. Look at the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim and his father, Nuh, his wife, and his son. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about them, how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explain the situation between Ibrahim, who is Khalilullah, the most beloved to Allah azza wa jal? What was his relationship with his father? Do you guys remember what happened with him and his father? His father told him what, what to do. Get out. Don't show me your face again. Otherwise, I'm going to stone you. I'm going to throw rocks at you. His dad told him that. Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's an example of him. And then you have the example of Nuh. 950 years da'wah. Day and night. Day and night giving da'wah to his wife, to his child. He ended up with what? Disbelieving wife and disbelieving son. Ya'qub, subhanAllah. A household of prophets, Ya'qub, 12 children. Well, how, what was the quality of the, of, of the family there? What was the quality between these kids? They almost killed each other. In the house of Prophet Ya'qub alayhi salam. And not just that, after all these long years, imagine after all these long years, would you think that, you know, it's over, we should reconcile and so on. When Yusuf alayhi salam put that measurement cup in the, in the luggage of his brother, and then he pulled it out in front of them, what was the first thing they said to Yusuf alayhi salam? They, they couldn't recognize Yusuf at the time yet. So what did they say to him? He said, oh my God, if he did that, he had an, old, an older brother before, he was a thief too. In his face. And for Yusuf, Ali was just like, I was, I was about to forgive you, but you know what? You don't deserve forgiveness. He could have thought this way. And that's what Allah says about him. He says, in his, in his heart, he holds you, Bal antum sharrun makana. You worse people. Oh my God, you're so horrible. That's what he's thinking about in that moment, subhanAllah. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing us all these examples in the Quran? For a simple reason. To teach us and tell us that your biggest test is going to come from those who you love the most. Your biggest test is going to come from those who you would love the most. From your spouse, from your children, from your in-laws, from the people around you, your family, basically. This is going to be your biggest test. So uh, um, don't tell me you're patient with your friends or your co-workers or strangers. That's easy. Show me the quality of patience at home. Show me the quality of patience with your family. That's when you come talk about patience with me. Sheikh, any final comment, inshallah, from your part? Um, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also get counseling sessions with no. Sheikh Yasser. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh Nabarakallah Feek. Thank you very much for being with us, inshallah tabaraka wa ta'ala. We will continue, inshallah, our discussion with the 20 points of Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimullah. And apologize for not having enough questions over here, inshallah. We'll see you tomorrow. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.